on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Got all of this information in my head and to pare it down just to that story was incredibly hard. My partner helped me with it, but you know, we're trying to get something that people want to read. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It is The Self-Publishing Show on a Friday with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. Here we are. Mark, we, can't, we have to be perfunctory and efficient this week for those 5% of people who don't like our amazing discussion at the beginning because we have a big packed episode tonight. So I'm going to I'm going to run through an agenda like I'm the most efficient civil servant ever. And so first of all, we're going to say a Patreon shout out. Would you like to do the Patreon shout outs? Can you see them on your screen? No, I can't. So you can do those. I'm not going to speak very much this episode. It's all, it's all you. I'm not even sure why I'm here. Barbara Ferrier. I know why you're here, Barbara, because you have become a Patreon supporter of ours or Patreon as you like. And Ethan Cole from Alabama, USA. Uh, aren't Ethan there, Cole. Aren't there three? Uh, I think ooh. I think Catherine said we had three patrons this week. Ah, yes, there was one from last week. Kimberly Irwin. Kimberly Irwin. I'm so sorry we missed you last week, but you get, I'm going to say it three times, Kimberly Irwin. You get three mentions along with Barbara Ferry and Ethan Cole. Oh, you've all had three now. Uh, thank you very much indeed for going to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. One of the great benefits of that, and this is an amazing link, is that you may get selected to go into our book lab, our book laboratory, where we bring in experts to dissect, critique, and give you feedback on the three key elements of your book, which is the writing from the look inside, the cover image, and the blurb the book package if you like uh very very useful for that individual and extremely useful for the rest of us i love these episodes i love talking to the experts i learn something every time i think honestly our collection of book lab episodes are uh, a great mini series in their own right so we are going to crack on because we've got some long interviews not long long interviews but you know we've got three interviews with the experts and an interview uh, with our victim, our victim. And I do use the word victim uh, because you have to put yourself forward and be brave. And this is Michelle Hanley. And Michelle, very well done for putting yourself forward for the book lab. We have an interview with Michelle afterwards when she hears the results. And I can tell you it wasn't all positive at all. So Michelle took it very, very well indeed. Um, her book, uh, you can see if you go to actually selfpublishingformula.com forward slash book lab nine, you will be able to see everything you need to see to help you watch this episode, which includes the uh, cover as it is before, because Michelle obviously might be changing that. In fact, I know she's going to be changing it in the, in the future. The blurb is going to be changed very soon indeed. And I'm just stalling for time because I'm just going to get her book up. Uh, Druid S Found is the book we've chosen from her series there. Druid S Found, if you want to have a look at it on Amazon now, you might see some of the new stuff. But if you go to book, uh, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash book lab nine, you can download what it looked like before and then hear uh, along with the interviews how things got critiqued and changed. Okay, we are going to start with the cover. Stuart Bash is the man to look at the cover and let's see what he thought of Druidess's fa Druidess Found's cover. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Stu Bash, welcome back to the self-publishing show. Love having a chat with you. We can catch up a little bit on trends, I think, in um, yeah. in covers. I know you've been posting a bit on that recently, and we're here specifically yes. to talk yeah. about a book by Michelle Hanley called Druidess Found. But let's start with uh, where we are with cover design. We talk, we've talked for a couple of years now about what works, what doesn't, and, and the role of the cover. What I'm interested in, just as a little catch up, is how much changes during that time. What, you know, from year to year, is what works mm. for thrillers and a romance cover two years ago different from what it is today? Uh, yes, in, it depends on the genre. So uh, crime and thriller is kind of glacial. So it's very slow, there are changes, and they do try new things every now and again. Uh, I posted in the community recently, actually, um, how there has been a massive um, change recently with crime and thriller, which is actually starting to fade out a little bit. So 
psychological thrillers are so, have been so big for so long, you know, um, uh, the, uh, you know, since Gone Girl, really, everything from that point onwards, um, there's, it's just been, you know, massive in terms of uh, how many books have been published, trad, and also in, in, in indie as well. Um, so those covers have influenced crime and thriller and action uh, in the last 12 months to two years. Um, you might not see it in totally, you know, so with Mark Dawson, for example, we've con had a consistent theme that works really well. Lee Child hasn't changed either. So those like, big name authors don't seem to need to, to change. Uh, Val McDermott hasn't changed her style for years. Um, in, uh, in McEwen hasn't changed either, but um, I think more new authors or um, authors that are have a big long series that have, I don't know, maybe they're looking to change a little bit, have tried to go a more psychological thriller route. And psychological thriller tend to be a little bit more, uh, have more of a metaphor or, or um, are a bit more visceral. So they might have like an object or... Um, you know, it might be something like just like smoke with some big type and going through it, or there might be an image of a scene. Um, so it, it tends to be less about uh, narrative and more about like a, a feel or an emotion instead. Um, psychological thrillers also have a lot of location based stuff. So um, they can have things like houses with a window lit up or a person in a window or a close up of a face. There's rarely ever. Um, fully narrative like a lot of action thriller or crime thriller is which you know will have things like a the detective in in location or um maybe it's the uh uh the um uh what am i thinking of the, the weapon or it's something like that you know it's kind of kind of fits fits more with what you'd expect from a crime thriller action uh book cover psychological thrillers tend to be a little bit more, uh, as I say, uh, abstract. Yeah. Um, you know, close up of an eye or yeah. whatever, and that's been sort of coming into crime and thriller. But it is on the way out. I, I've been told as well because I, I speak to a lot of people that I used to work with in trad who they work up to twelve months ahead of time, so they get to see a lot of trends kind of going, moving, in, and and how they flow way before I do. Because you know, I have to kind of look. When I was starting a new brief or a new new concept, I start looking at uh, Amazon or, uh, you know, when I was allowed to go to bookshops, I'd, I'd go to a bookshop and have a look around there um, and see what kind of was working at, at the moment and what people are sort of pushing uh, into, into view, you know. With, with, um, but uh, the trad tends to have a little bit more uh, time on their hands. So I still actually, I've got a couple of contacts still in the industry, which I, kind of tap sometimes just to get an idea. Um, and uh, yeah, the, it, it is starting to fall back into the more traditional sense. Uh, I, I realise I've just been talking about crime and thriller, but it does tend to be my um, yeah. butter. So, well, I've um, enjoyed, I like the covers you did for Mark's Attica series. I really like them yeah. actually. I mean, a place to very strange. I think it's a fantastic cover. Um, and the text, yeah. seem, that seems to be the font and text seems to be a trend of the last couple of years. David Baldaccia, I think, has similar That's um, right. looking font. And I really like that. It's very modern and clean and fresh at the same time, sinister, which is what you want it to yeah. be. I think the other thing about that is that it's more, you know, it's, it's kind of more about, uh, it's less about, you know, obviously his John Milton is it's action, it's you know location. You want to kind of tell all of that in in the cover. Where he where is he now? You know, and whereas that kind of thing is you want to know with the Attica stuff. You want to know um, this. It has to have a little bit of a sense of mystery to it. You know, um, and uh, a more washed out black and white color theme works really well with very bold colors and actually making the title really big as well is really good. It's a real popular thing in the last few years as well, because, because of ebook and because of the amount of money that's put into digital marketing rather than, you know, in, in Instagram, Facebook, um, Amazon, the amount of money that's put into that instead of print stuff, it has changed a lot. I used to be of the opinion that it didn't really matter about the thumbnail, thumbnail because we were selling on Amazon way before ebooks, came out so no one cared then so why do they care now however 
um, because it, all, almost everything, all our lives are online now. I think it has changed and people now do expect, you know, I, I do for LJ Ross, for example, we do uh, a lot of her covers and we have two different things now. So we have the paperback, which you know, has a gold foil and everything like that. But the ebook is the same cover, but colors are boosted. Some text is kind of removed and, uh, and, and the text is rather than having a gold foil, we'll have like a, it'd be bold white color or um, it basically just to stand out. So you can read it and it just looks a bit more colorful. You know, obviously there's, there's always a difference between RGB, so digital and CMYK print. CMYK, you can't always get the, the best colors, but if you're just going to have an ebook, um, then why not boost the colors as much as possible? And obviously you can have separate files on Amazon as well. So you can have what the Kindle book will look like opposite what the paperback will look like. Um, but in terms of other genres and stuff, you know, genres are um, uh, like romance changes all the time. We still do have lots of tropes with, um, you know, whether, whether it's a, a, a f- photographic, so it's a female in, in like location or, uh, uh, you know, with, with their hat, if it's sunny or whatever, you know, there's, there's, it tends to be quite beautiful and, aspirational that that seems to be quite big at the moment uh the photographic route um i've been told though the paired back look which was really popular a couple of years ago so think of cecilia ahern which was bold type plain color no no gradient or anything just maybe like a, a nice sort of eggshell blue whatever and a very small illustration you know maybe a little heart on or or, or a key or something like that um isn't working for most also it still works for Cecilia O'Hearn, people like that, but it's That's not working for anyone else. And that the kind of more funny, almost chiclet style covers, which were really popular, say, four or five years ago, are really, really popular again now um, uh, in terms of the style of illustration. So sort of cartoony. Almost sort of illustrated, in heels with a glass of wine cartoon. tripping. Or... Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. There's a little bit of humour to it. It's kind yeah. of like a Bridget Jones type thing, you know, where you know she's falling over, and there's, yeah. as you say, the glass is falling over. Or she's, or there's a sort of slightly cheesy male character leaning against the type, you know, that kind of thing. That seems to be quite popular too. Um, mm. But you know, it, it, they do change. It's it's worth always trying to keep up to date. Yeah, I, I know that there's always the an indie versus. Uh, trad things sometimes with how people think about things and you know in trad have um are behind the times and many things sometimes um but having been a cover designer and working in house for you know 10 plus years the amount of work that goes into the cover and the thought and time and that kind of thing is um it's you know and have far ahead it, when you're thinking about trends have a look at what trad are doing and just you don't always have to i mean indie have so many smaller genres and specific areas yeah. and stuff sort of, sort of niche stuff that you're probably better off looking at that if that's what you're doing online looking at other indie authors but when it comes to you know the the main genres the, the big genres then uh try to have the amount of it's worth it's free information so you might as well have yes. a look at it and get yeah. an idea what they're doing good and if you're wondering why it's important to know what people are doing and what's working and thinking well i'll do something different so my book stands out and why that might be a mistake for your marketing that particular uh method uh you should have a look at Stuart's course, which is available at uh, selfpublishingformula.com forward slash design, where you do explain why familiar is important and the role of the cover, which leads us to that discussion we had there about being up to date with what's working and what's not. But uh, yeah. we, uh, we won't go into all of that now. I think it's time probably to move on to Druid S Found by Michelle Hanley. Um, so your job here, uh, Stuart, is to give us a critique on the cover. Yeah. And... Um, the, the point, the best thing either of us could do is to look at the cover for about one or two seconds and then look at another cover because that's what punters do, right? It's that instant take. And yeah. what was your what was your initial impression? Um, I mean, my initial impression was that it's it's homemade, um, and you know, I, I struggle sometimes because I I I, I'm, I admire people who 
who do this, who put their own covers together. I, I, they, I'm, I might be completely wrong. They might have had someone professionally do this. It does feel to me homemade. Um, and there's a huge amount of effort that goes into that. And it's, it's a scary thing to do. Um, but it doesn't work very often. And the, the reasons why this cover doesn't work and why I know it's homemade is because there hasn't been a lot of thought put into how the images work. So how they work together, what the composition is, um, and also the uh, way fonts have been used. And so if I'm looking over here, I'm just looking at the cover, but um, yeah. um, and how images are uh, have been put together. I think it's, it doesn't really give me a huge amount about the genre. I My initial reaction to it, uh, before I looked into it a little bit uh, more um, in terms of you know, the information about the book, um, my initial reaction was that it was sci-fi of some sort, sci-fi romance maybe, um, but um, the title didn't seem to work very well with that. Uh, Druidess found made me think more about, you know, well, Druids and Celts and that kind of thing. So it felt like it was sci-fi, but it, yeah, I, I was a bit confused. So it's losing me on genre. Um, and there's, uh, for the people who aren't watching on YouTube, there's a, a, a woman's face uh, who was quite large on the cover. And it looks like one of those photos that you'd find in a frame when you buy a frame at the shops and you bring home and it's already got a photo in it and it's sort of a model uh, sort of looking, which is usually with a family. I can imagine there's a family, actually, the rest of the photo. and There's, there's just a man with out. his arms wrapped around it. And in the end, yeah, you bring the frame home somewhere. and you think, these people are better looking than my family, so I'm just yeah. going to leave them in there <laughs> on the rental piece. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. And um <laughs> And, uh, Apologies and, and then there's a, a figure which kind of reminds me of um, who has six fingers, who reminds me of... Oh, I hadn't noticed that. Oh, yeah, who sweet. reminds me of a yeah. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle for some reason, yeah. um, hovering over the top. Um, now, I understand the concept. So, you know, I've, I've worked long enough in, in design to know... What, how a person has come up with a concept. You know, th this is, for me, it's about two worlds. So we've got a normal, like, everyday human 21st century woman and an alien-type figure there. So it's two worlds. There's, I feel like it's something to do with romance straight away. Um, and, um, you know, the subtitle is The Inhabitants of the Centre of the Universe Novel. So it does feel like it's very much sci-fi. Um, so that's the image. It's a bit confused. And then when I, th you know, the typography, there's a lot, you know, it's, they're using a, it looks like um, Caslon, um, like 42 or something, which is essentially it's like normal Caslon, which is a serif font, but has like, it's been uh, sort of made to look a bit old. So it's a bit, uh, I guess, if, you know, if you've, used a typewriter too many times, you know, you haven't cleaned it or added new keys or anything. It kind of has like slight bobbly edges around the type when you type, um, kind of has that, uh, which I use a lot and I use it for historical fiction. So it's uh, a typeface that has associations in my mind as a designer. And I think if anyone else looked at it would think that it has to do with historical fiction, but it's on a sci-fi cover. It There are just to, I have a slight tangent when it comes to design um a good designer doesn't use filters and a good designer doesn't use a ton of um effects um because what that says is that effects are there for people who are new to design and it's a way of and i think when when you also when you're doing stuff yourself you throw effects onto things because you think that's what design is i'm i'm changing it i'm i'm making it look good or different or i'm making it stand out from everything else and that's good enough and and in this case the title has a very very strong outer glow on it which um and then it has a gradient over the top of it so you're trying to make it stand out and then you're pushing it back at the same time which I, it, it's very, like I say, it just makes me feel like it's definitely homemade because of all of those things. Um, and those things are sort of no-nos. I think, it, like I say, 
uh, I hope if she added that extra finger to the guy, by the way, with the hand, that's really good because yeah. because it's not easy to do something like that. So I'm guessing that she hasn't. But if she has, then she has got. I'm assuming if if Michelle did this, that she has got the ability to to do some design. So yeah, I think um, okay. overall it's not a great cover. So that's basically what I'm trying to say in a, the nicest possible yes. way. Yeah. Okay. And I I I, uh, I also felt it looked like something that was homemade. Um, and one of the things one of the things we should do with our covers is make sure they're indistinguishable from from the trad industry and from the bestsellers. Uh, it's easy actually to do that. I mean, my cover is incredible. You've done a, such a great job on the cover of my book. I'm so pleased with that. You know, considering you're going to be paying for editing, there are going to yeah. be costs with launching any products. There's going to be some cost. This is, it's not that expensive to have a cover that's not going to, at a glance, look like it's homemade. We're at the, we're at the high end yeah. as well. Okay. So, you know, we, we know our team are all, all trad designers and stuff. So we, you know, they, it's, it's different. We're working with people who've got a lot of experience and that's what you're paying for with us. Um, whereas there are people out there that you can get that as long as their portfolio are, are decent and they've managed to do, a, you know, we, we, we see designers all the time on Twitter and on, on um, SPF on a, on a Saturday yeah. when you, you get to, you know, do your shout outs and stuff and self-promotion. There are plenty of designers in there that you should, that people should definitely go to and have a look at. Cause I look at them all the time. They don't know I'm looking, but I look mm. just cause I like to see mm. what people are doing. And, you know, we're always looking for new designers ourselves and new freelancers. So it's always good to see what people are doing anyway. It is you can do it for much cheaper. We are, like I say, we're at the high end. Uh, I do remember our, our prices are now it's um, 453 book and 525 for paperback. Um, and I can't believe I forgot all of that. Um, yeah, but, um, that's all right. Well, um, that, I, the other thing I was going to say is that if you if you want to know what we're talking about, you know, if you're you're in a particular genre, this is I, I was just looking at the categories since so metaphysical fantasy. I think was. Um, uh, was the top category that it was in. If yeah. you click on that underneath this book, you'll see the top one, two, three, four, you know, the top 100 of them. You can have a look at them and just have a look at those covers. And we'll just, would my cover sit there next to those and look and stand out or look normal? And, um, and the two things I would say, just technically two things from a non-technical person, actually the sort of general way it's put together is pretty much in tune with a couple of those quite a busy environment yeah. with stars and stuff as background. But the font, none of them have a font that looks like that. None of them. Um, some of them have a very clean modern font. Um, one of them does have a bit of afterglow, but in a very specific way. That's the number one, actually, the one I'm looking at at the moment, Danica Dark. Uh, another one, number three in that chart from a distant star, has that same sort of busy star field background, but a very clean modern font, which looks quite nice. Um, and the other thing is just the way like the woman's head is cut off and blends or doesn't really blend yeah. with the background that you don't see that in these books. Every little hair it's the sort of thing you, you and your team painstakingly do is prop is either there or not there. And it is molded and yeah. you know, it's blended in the background. And those are the things that stand out and make this why you would say at a glance. And I would say the glance looks like it's homemade and not a pro cover. Absolutely. I hope it I, isn't I mean, a pro cover. It is. I don't think it is. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, I think there, there are things that could be done and to make it better. I think it is worth looking at the genre a bit more, but I also think it's worth looking at the, because when I looked as well, I noticed there was things like fantasy romance, yeah. which as well, which is quite big. And, you know, there are different ways of looking at it. So you could have exactly what, what I think Michelle has tried to do here, which is have a figure, which is the central, you know, this is about this girl or this woman and things are happening to her and, you know, otherworldly, whether it's fantasy based or um, sci-fi based. And I think you could find a great model somewhere, even on Shutterstock or uh, Neo Stock, somewhere like that and build everything around her. That's what a lot of them do is, you know, you've got the central character, urban fantasy do that as well. So I don't think it's that a million miles away from this. Um, but then the opposite thing to do would be to remove the person completely and go type and image um, object yeah. based. Because in romantic fantasy, both of those types of cover are working alongside each other, which is quite unusual, isn't it? Yeah, and that's the thing. It's um, it's usually you, know, you get a strong theme yeah. running through, 
Um, and I think with this, this is romantic fantasy. There are covers like From Blood and Ash, which might be different because that's, once again, I'm not entirely certain how much of it is fantasy and how much of it is sci-fi. But so From Blood and Ash has like a, a an, an arrow and I think it's like a dagger or something like that. So that might be wrong for this, but in terms of the objects, but the, the way that the font works with the image in the background is exactly what I think they could do. And that's just simplify things. So if you are going to do it yourself, find a really good background image that works for what you're looking for. Uh, for, for the genre, for example, um, and then have some nice type on top. You know, it doesn't have to be just two-dimensional in that respect where it's just fl quite flat. You can work on it still and make it look good. But um, another example is to do something like um, A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mars. I want to say yeah. her name is Mars. Yeah. Um, her, co her covers are strong colour with an illustrated, like, simple mm. symbol with bold type on top. And once again, that might be more fantasy historical, so it might not be quite right in terms of genre, but in terms of what could work and what could be quite simple with the next stage of this cover could easily be that. It could be, you know, it could work with the type. It could, you could have something that's a bit more illustrated, but still be sci-fi, you know? Yeah. Um, looking at the work of, of a designer like, say, um, Michaela Elcano, um, who is who works a lot for Voyager, uh, Harper Voyager in the UK. Her stuff is, she's a huge amount of sci-fi and fantasy and lots of everything in between. And it's worth having a look at her stuff um, because she kind of marries that both of those things together quite well. She does a, she's one of our main designers, but um, I mm. don't mind if people want to just go after her. So she's, um, but she, you know, and go and go and, you know, commission her separately she's fantastic at what she does um and she's got a really good eye for that kind of thing she did um uh ember ember and the ashes or ember, ember and ashes or something like that um it's quite a big, big book a couple of years ago right um it did really well uh so um a lot of a lot of her stuff is oh and she does a lot of um very similar stuff to from blood and ash in fact i wouldn't be entirely so um be surprised if she did that is her ash. cover so yeah She's that kind of star, and that's what you need to look at. And I think the a good example you said potentially um, one option is to choose a model for of which there are who fits your your character, and there are a few images to choose from for your series going down. And a really good example of that is Lindsay Hall, uh, Lindsay, who's been on this show at, at various points. Um, fantastic writer, always in the charts. Now, if you look at her series, click on her author name on Amazon, and then look at her series. I'll try and get John to put this on the screen. Take a screen grab now while I remember. Um, you've got the same model. In fact, her, her Shadow Guild Wolf Queen series, it's the same model, it's the same wolf, and it's the same background on one, two, three, four, five books in a row. And they look fantastic. At a glance, do the job, tell you the genre, look professional, identify the series together. Not that complicated, yeah. the assets really there, are they? But wow, doesn't that work well? And she's got another series with another model and a very similar thing so from the design point of view they don't they, they even just they play with the background a little bit in terms of its tilt and its its direction but it's basically the same same set of assets isn't it yeah and that's that's what you should do with the series really is kind of have them all tied together and then i think as long as they are different enough so that you know that you haven't bought the same book that kind of thing which is important but i think yeah and, and i thought i think if if this book is about romance then maybe there should be something that is you know, a little bit more like uh, Lindsay's, um, uh, my th is it my Mytherian, my Mytherian yeah. Arcana series, something like that. You could go that direction if you wanted to. But otherwise, having a, a you know, a great model image and, um, and working with that with the background and having it kind of consistent throughout your series would be a really good idea. Yeah. Love Lindsay's covers, they're great. Um, well, we'll find out from Michelle uh, what she thinks the, the genre should be most accurately and, and move on from that. So, okay, so, you know, that's what the book lab's all about. We shouldn't um, uh, yeah. we shouldn't uh, feel too bad about being critical in this case because that's how we see it and you see it and you're the expert in this area. But there are other views available. 
of course, my show. Of course. And we'll hear not, from Not as good, but, but <laughs> yeah, not as good as views <laughs> as ours. But uh, uh, we will hear from Michelle at the end of this podcast. Stuart, thank you for entering the laboratory. It's been too long, my friend. Mm. Yes, it has, show. really has. Um, yeah. And uh, I would say again, I know you've been doing a bit of work in the groups recently. I know you're doing a bit of work on the course at selfpublishingforum.com forward slash design. It's a fantastic course uh, for two people. It's for the people who want to design their own covers and have them look pro, uh, professional. But it's also for authors to enable you to commission a cover better, to be a better commissioner of a cover, to understand the role of the cover and understand uh, when you've given the designer the right direction to get the right thing from you. I think it's, uh, it's every author should understand that. Every author who's indie should know that. If you're trad, you don't have to worry sure. about it. Other people have to worry about yeah. those things for you. Good. That's it. Well, I will let you go and um, Thank you. work through your list of designs. I'll have another book for you to, uh, to, yeah. uh, to do the cover from in the next 10 years. No, it'll be, yeah, soon, well, it'll be no, sooner than that. It's should sooner than that, I think, I hope. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> I, I think you've sent the brief. Have you sent the brief? I've sent a brief, yes. Yeah, perfect. I think I, I would hold soon. off. I would hold off for the moment because I think I'm probably not going to go with redneck decided. <laughs> it's um, too pejorative as a term, but uh, we'll come up. Red something, I think, will be in the title. But um, yeah, you've got the idea. We can change the title. Though. We changed the title yeah. the last one, didn't we? So Yeah, we did, yeah. There's no, no problem changing a title. Changing the whole, whole cover is different, but yes. yeah, changing the title is easy. No, no, the other assets, they'll be the same. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Stuart. We'll speak no to problem. you next time. Yeah, speak to you soon. Bye. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. That is Stuart. I'm going to crack straight on with the blurb. The blurb may have changed by the time you're looking at it on Amazon. So just to reiterate, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash book lab nine, you download the original blurb that you'll hear uh, Brian Cohen talking about now. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. BC, I caught you mid drink. What are you drinking there? Oh, you're in the South now, so that must be um, uh, rye. Whiskey rye, and rye. Or, or, or rye with sweet tea. I'm not sure. Bourbon. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you've moved from the uh, yes. from the very far north to the well, not quite the deep south, but the south south of the Mason Dixie in North Carolina. I can't do it. Southern accent. I won't try. That's okay. I'm not going to try either. I'll only try when we're off air. But yeah. um, we we are happy to have a little extra warmth. It won't really kick in until we're in the winter months uh, that we'll notice it, but. Uh, yeah, and so different background for what I think is either my ninth or tenth appearance on wow. the podcast, and I'm grateful for every single are you, one. Are you angling for another mug? No, I want the jacket. I'm. Te I want yeah, the. You want the... upgrade? The... I've had an idea actually. We oh, might okay. we might do um, challenge coins. Do you know what okay. they are? You know what they are? No. You don't know what they are. So they're a military thing in America. I was introduced to them by I think our friend Dave Chesson. Mm. who had this challenge coin from his unit. You know, he was a submariner, wasn't he, in, um, in the US Navy. And he had this challenge coin. And basically, you had them issued, anyone could do them in a small unit, even part of a unit in the military. You'd have your own one. And different things happened with them. But one is that basically you had to have it on you the whole time. And if you were challenged, you didn't have it on you. There was a forfeit, usually involved buying the drinks. So people would put their challenge coins on the table and the person, the poor numpty who'd forgotten their coin, they changed their trousers earlier in the day, pants. Um, they had to pay the drinks. Anyway, someone <laughs> gave me uh, a couple others. We've, I've now got a collection of four, I think, from America. Oh, wow. Um, I've got some, a great one. Um, yeah, anyway, I was thinking we should do some SPF ones. We should have like a standard one and like a gold one. And for somebody who makes like 10 appearances, you could get a gold challenge coin. I would love a gold coin with SPF on it. I'm no gonna, question. I'm going to pitch this to, uh, to Dawson. Anyway, okay. we're not here to waffle about this. We are here to talk about Michelle Hanley's uh, Druidess Found. And your job, Brian Cohen, is to look at the blurb and give us your opinion and basically give it a go. Uh, so first of all, what was your impression of the Druidess Trilogy Book 1 blurb as it sits on Amazon right now? There, there are definitely positive things about it. And I think we found this through eight of these book labs that it, it's not like authors don't have an idea of, of the important moments and the important things to highlight in their blurb. I think that um, 
there is a hook. There is their meeting was not by chance. It was orchestrated. A lot of blurbs don't have hooks. So for this to have a hook, thumbs up. The uh, there, this one is infused with uh, emotion for the characters. Uh, we have these night terrors for our main uh, male protagonist, Moto, and we have the kind of the the tragic past with her with her parents for Kaylee. We have emotion baked in. This is a thumbs up, and we also have a, a cliffhanger at the end. Will their connection save or destroy? The universe. All of these are really good positives. And I think that that should, you know, Michelle did a really good job with those. I think on the, uh, the con side, it's definitely pretty long. It's definitely some very meaty paragraphs here. And as we know, not everybody has the attention span that we hope they would, particularly our children, but uh, our readers as well. We want to make sure that we're not uh, packing it too tight with with too much information. And I think that is the, the number one thing that this blurb struggles with. Too much information and too long. I'm just trying to do the word count. 310 words. So two, 200 to 250, you think is that is good length? That's usually it. But even some are, are, are fewer than yeah. 200 and they absolutely get away with it. Yeah. Okay, and I think that's because that was my first question to you. And as you may have known, I've been through the whole blurb uh, experience, which was fairly brutal. I found it really difficult. <laughs> However many discussions we'd had together about it, I found yes. it difficult to write my own blurb. It's but, tough. Yeah, uh, but I was I was struggling a lot with how much do you want to go on about the story and 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 what what's on off, and how much do you just basically want to say this is the type of book this is, and here's a reason to to read it. You don't need don't need a lot of story in there, do you? No, well, I mean, obviously, when you've written the book, and this is the thing that you you found you struggled with, when you've written the book, it is so hard to get that distance that you need to 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 know what is important. You know that uh, that airplane distance uh, above the helicopter. Um, yes, exactly. And so we need to either do that on our own or work with somebody, certainly. But I would say that more often than not. If you have the choice to include an emotional beat that the character is dealing with or a story beat of uh, uh, what uh, are the specifics of the story in that given moment, for instance, in uh, Michelle's, the, uh, the very specific mentions of Moto's alien race, the Kaoli queen, the Kaoli, though Kaoli only bond with other Kaoli, in our uh, uh, the best page forward take of this, we didn't even mention it okay. because yes, it's important to know that this person is an alien, but you can also just say they're an alien or they're a part of this different race. They live in this other place. That's enough. We don't need to, we certainly don't need to mention it several times what, what the, their specific alien race is. Um, but actually I noticed there's a fourth one even further further down that I didn't see in the third paragraph, we can strip out a lot of those specifics and we can get down to, I mean, people caring about people, people yeah. uh, struggling with with the, the situation in the book. Yeah. Okay. And I, th I have sympathy for you, Michelle, if you're listening. Uh, I'm sure you are. You're going to listen to this and we're going to talk to you. Um, <laughs> I do have sympathy for you because I know how hard this is now. Whereas before I was very dismissive of any, no, I wasn't. I was always sympathetic. <laughs> I quite, I tell you what I do like about this. I think the structure is quite good. I thought, you know, sent, uh, paragraph one is one half of the situation. Paragraph two is the, the other element that's going to change things. Then paragraph three just sort of takes it forward and cements what the book's about. So I think structurally it's not a bad. And then there's an extra little bit. If you love romance, you love um, romance, you love fantasy. This book's for you. A little bit of uh, selling it at the bottom. I don't think that's a bad way to lay it out, is it? No. And I think she understands the importance of, of, of the timing in these, because I think that her hook and, and this kind of almost selling paragraph hook esque thing yeah. that is after the cliffhanger, they're well timed. I think that, uh, that they, they just need a little shaping. Yeah. So paragraph one, Moto, paragraph, 
power off to Kaylee and then that um that bringing it together um one thing we talked about with Stuart was what is the genre and is it very easily identifiable um so it's not going to confound any reader expectations from the cover uh and he wasn't convinced about that and you've also you're not not wholly sure if this is quite pitched at the right genre or what were your what are your misgivings on that front well, it's interesting because we've, I, I've, my team and I, we do a lot of work on figuring out what is the genre and, and we don't always know. I think even our own story, it can be difficult to get that uh, distance as well. We've written a lot of sci-fi romance uh, book descriptions, and we've also done some fantasy romance descriptions. This sounds like just straight up sci-fi romance. There is a female human there is a male warrior alien, and maybe that alien looks like a human, but uh, uh, they're definitely not from around here. <laughs> um, those are the tropes of sci-fi romance. Right. They, they, I'm not entirely sure, and maybe this is where we need to dig deeper with Michelle. I'm not entirely sure why this is fantasy, because it sounds like many of the sci-fi romance uh, blurbs that we've written. And if it is sci-fi romance, if it is in fact sci-fi romance, that might give this a better selling point because yeah. fantasy romance, to my knowledge, at least written in this way, is not as popular of a subgenre as sci-fi romance. So there is a chance that just by branding it fantasy romance, Michelle might be shooting herself in the foot a little bit. Yeah. And now that you talk about sci-fi romance, that's interesting because I don't think Stuart and I really landed on that, but we were a bit confused by what what the cover was doing. And it is now you say sci-fi romance, looking at it with the star nebula, the Earth, uh, other planets. Mm, that does that yeah. again. These are sci-fi tropes, right? So, okay, well, that's interesting. And that might be really helpful for Michelle because I think it's so, so important to get the genre right uh, all the way through in the cover, in the blurb, in the tagline, in the ad copy so that you're getting the right readers. It's really important. I'm noticing that already, like everyone does. One or two people buy my book and leave a, you know, sort of half-hearted review. And then they say, well, I've never really read, I don't really read this genre in there. And you think, well, that's what happens when you get the wrong readers um, for your books. You you know, you you risk getting poor reviews, people disappointed with it because it's not what they wanted. Right. Um, okay, so let's hear your takes. I'm not going to read out uh, Michelle's, but you can get it obviously at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash booklab9. It is nine, isn't it? I think it's nine. Um, I couldn't remember if it was eight or nine. I think it's that nine. Was my Book Lab my nine. Um, and uh, you can read <laughs> what was there before, but let's hear best page forwards team effort here. Sure. Yes, we we had five different people. I think six with me working on it. Wow. So we were all we were all involved. It was a team effort. Yes. So he fights to protect his world. She's searching for peace when a per a portal throws them together. We'll even the stars survive. Moto can't shake his ominous nightmares. With persistent visions of his planet and people's destruction, the chosen warrior fears every possible future until his search for answers reveals an alluring young woman on a lush world whose beauty blots out his dread of doomsday. Kaylee Law, and cut me off whenever you want to. No, no, you, I want to hear the whole thing. I'm into it now. Okay, cool. What's going to happen? Kay yeah, Kaylee longs for tranquility. Mourning the anniversary of her foster parents' passing, she finds herself jolted from the quiet by unsettling dreams of a dark, handsome stranger. Drawn to a mysterious rune, she's shocked when one touch whisks her away from Scotland and onto an unfamiliar alien terrain. As Moto discovers the misplaced intruder is the same woman he's been watching, he's torn between tradition and an urge to open his heart. And though Kaylee frantically searches for a way back home, her bond with the otherworldly man and the power growing inside her speak to an undeniable destiny. Will the couple's bond spark a revolution that saves their worlds, or will it turns, turn Moto's nightmare into blood-red reality? Druid is Found is the enthralling first book in the Druidist Trilogy romantic fantasy series. If you like intriguing characters, spectacular settings, and steamy liaisons, then you'll love Michelle Hanley's page-turning tale by Druid is Found to unlock fate's doorway today. Wow, that's great. Oh, well, thanks. I mean, also, I think, in tribute to Michelle, it's got a lot of the themes that she worked on, but you've just given it that 
that succinctness. Yeah. Less is more, right, in this stuff. And I, I think sometimes, you know, I've been running a lot of different ads for different books, like Fuse books, my own book, and some have quite wordy copy. Some say, you know, one of my ads that performs quite well for my book says a Cold War thriller. That's the text. And it's funny yeah. that if, if you get the right target audience, people who like Cold War thrillers, like REF thrillers, in a way, all you're going to do is put them off by putting too much on there. Once they've seen a good cover and a, a tagline. So I think the blurb, people do expect to learn a little bit more about the book. If they're going to read it, They need, you can't right. just get away with, I mean, the Hunt for Red October, I think is like a 25 word um, <laughs> uh, blurb, but less is more. And that's that's really strong what you've uh, you've put out there. And you've still gone with that structure, I think, of, of setting up Moto first and then Kaylee. Yes. Um, I think you've got the character stuff really strong. Uh, there, particularly Kaylee. I had a lot more of an impression of who she was from your blurb than I did actually from Rochelle's, which is such an important thing. Yeah, I think it, uh, actually this is a this is a commonality we find in some of the romance submissions we get sometimes because the the there I mean it's so important that the male character in in MF romance is uh, is is very strongly illustrated as either the the billionaire or the strong person with a, a six pack abs and that they have their own tortured past. And sometimes as is the case in a, a famous, famous romance trilogy, 50 shades of gray, we don't feel like we get a lot from who is the actual female protagonist in this. And, and I think uh, to, to Michelle's credit there, there's the, the building blocks are all there. Like you said, it just was a, it was just a little long. Really, yeah. and it was sometimes we were able to take some of the sentences almost straight from hers and just shorten, find a way. As I talk about in my book, How to Write a Sizzling Synopsis, we talk about trading down words. How can you find a way to make nine words into five words? How can you make 11 words into seven words? Sometimes it takes a, a lot because you have to restructure the whole sentence to make it work. And uh, I was working personally on the the final, final, final draft of this one, and sometimes you get into the situation with the uh, it's the parents of the person of this, and you're like, oh, well, let's get some of these ofs out of here. Let's get some of these possessives, and it's not easy, which is why people struggle with blurbs and they're yeah. a pain in the butt sometimes. But it's it's helpful when it just you can cut to the chase. Oh. I'd like to write you a shorter letter, but I don't have the time. Exactly. It's a quote, isn't it? <laughs> of um, Love Oscar that. Wilde or somebody, or Hemingway, I don't know. Anyway, um, that's great. Uh, and what a good job your team do. And we should say that um, Michelle, as being selected, as being a Patreon supporter of the show and being selected for this, gets your services for free, which is great. And I think you do a really good job. You supply everything effectively as if she was a paying customer, right? You get the blurb cut down and some ad copy and stuff, which is great. Thank you. Um, but if people wanted to uh, part with cash and employ your services, <laughs> how uh, or, or, you know, sheep or goats, whatever you take, and now that you're not almost going to be very rude about the South, that was some... Um, Better cut that, John, uh, or sheep or goats, <laughs> whatever you take. Um, what? Uh, where should they go, and how much should they expect to pay for a blurb? Oh, sure, great question. So um, we, they can go to bestpageforward.net forward slash blurbs. Uh, we do have a, I think, in a link in the cheat sheet that you'll give out the before and after to get kind of an ad copywriting cheat sheet, which is a newer one we have out there. So you can get kind of our nine step process for writing better ad copy. Basically to have five people pound your blurb into something that uh, really shines. Usually the the ongoing price is $297. Uh, kind of one of those, um, you, you pay the plumber to work 10 minutes, uh, but you're paying him for 20 years of experience. We do now have about 4,000 book descriptions under our belt. And so I know there are people that do charge less for a book description, but uh, we're very fortunate to have worked on a whole lot of them. But we do run discounts and we have discount promotions for buying uh, packs of three and five. And we have some some new add-ons coming in the future. I'll tease them here first, but we have some new add-ons in addition to book descriptions 
uh, and the ad copy. So I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah, that's the tease. Well, I'm coming. I'm coming to you next time. There's no way I'm going to try and write my blurb next time. Honestly, James, when when I heard you were you were having trouble with it, I wondered why you didn't come to us yeah. first. We would have given you a sweetheart deal, sir. I would have got a ten percent discount. That would have been excellent. Um, oh, like I six or seven percent. Uh, yeah, I think. <laughs> It's in my nature to want to do things myself, and I have to I have to go through that process before I then hand it out. It's just just how I think I operate. But uh, yeah, I am definitely going to uh, avail myself, and I might even commit myself to a three book package. And then I've got that money there it means I've got to write those other two books after. This. So the next book for me is set in America as well, which is you know that's your neck of the woods. That's where you are. You're in America. I know America. You I've know lived that. here my whole life. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> All sorted. And now you're seeing the whole country. You've been for the north, the south. I know. I know. It's amazing. Um, BC, great to talk to you. Always lovely to catch up. Thank you so much. And on behalf of Michelle, thank you for that uh, that wonderful blurb. I'm sure she's going to be, I, I'm sure she's going to be pleased with. And we'll talk to her a bit about tightening the, um, I mean, it does, I just noticed actually, she does say it's a groundbreaking cross genre series, which makes me shudder a little bit because that does, give you a challenge then to to yes. market rather than make it a, a, an asset. It's actually, I think, a challenge. Um, are we going to see you this year live somewhere? Are we going to see you in the autumn, any of the conferences? I will be at the 20 Books Vegas in November, and then uh, I will be having a virtual event in February 2022. So definitely, you know, come either to Vegas or come to your computer and, and see yeah. me. Uh, but I will be around and, and I just want to thank you, James, for having me on the, the show so often because uh, I really enjoy it. And my team is very happy to have our work spread about the podcast sphere and the Facebook lives that you do with this. So just a, a big thank you. Hey, we love it. Love having you on. Thanks, Brian. We'll see you next time. All right. Take care. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Now, finally, from the experts, we have the writing. It's quite important, isn't it? The writing and the look inside you get. I don't remember what percentage it is of the book is shown uh, on Amazon, but that chunk of change is what we look at. And our resident editor, Jenny Nash, has been reading it. And this is what she thought. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Jenny Nash, welcome back to the self-publishing show. It's always a pleasure. And I think I've said this before, some of the most memorable conversations I've had for me as a writer have been with you. Um, I mean, oh, not, well, thank you. not just the working together we professionally did, but on these shows, when you dissect and talk about the clarity needed and the points and the things we get wrong, it's a really illuminating session. So I hope other people feel like that, but I think they do. I hope um, so too. Yeah, and uh, and we're going to hit the road again here with uh, with somebody <laughs> else's book, not mine, Michelle Hanley's. These people are very brave. I just have to say that 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 they are they're very brave to submit to to this sort of uh, critique, and it shows me that they want to learn and they want to grow, and good for them. Yeah, that's absolutely. I agree with that, and this bit in particular because the cover, although. I don't think Michelle did their own cover, but some people do. But the cover's the cover. That's not what you're known for. And the blurb, again, but the writing what we're talking about, that's what you are. It's the essence of you as an author, isn't it? So it's, it is particularly brave of somebody to put themselves out there and uh, and be criticised. Criticised in the proper sense of the word, not um, insulted, but critique, which is a very important part of, of growing. I, I certainly think so anyway. So, Absolutely. Druidus Found is the name of the book. And you have had a read through. And what are your initial impressions of the writing that we can see on the look inside? Yes. So um, for those who want to follow along, I was reading the Kindle version and I'll refer to some percentage um, percentages on the sample um, along the way. So the first thing that I want to say about Michelle's book is she has this incredibly powerful motivation for why she wants to write this story. And that you can find that just on her Amazon page, which I was poking around and and it's it's really it's really something. She as a as young reader, she loved three different genres. So she loved 
science fiction. She loved fantasy and she loved romance, the really steamy sort of um, what well here sometimes they're called bodice ripper romances, you know, and and she wondered why more writers don't put those three genres together. And she was yearning for a way for them to be put together. And she, as she grew older, she encountered paranormal romance, which has a little, a little bit of that, um, that mashup. But her desire to bring these three genres together, I think is really powerful. And I, I always tell writers to tap into their why. Why are you doing this? Why do you care? Why does this matter to you? Because writing a book is, as you well know, a very long, drawn out creative process. It is not something that happens quickly. It is, you know, an art form that takes a lot of time. And if you know why you care and why you're doing it, it's going to propel you through the hard parts. So I really liked seeing, seeing that in her description, a great, a great motivator. And you've got that in your own work and it comes through in the yeah. story. I think really. that's, yeah, that was a really interesting moment for me. And uh, I can see, I now know fully why it's important for you to ask the question, why, why is someone reading the book and, and things, it, it's quite a difficult question to answer maybe for authors listening, but believe me, when you've, come up with the answer things get easier to write your book it they starts do. to make sense and the themes start to make sense and what you need to be doing in the city down to seeing granular level starts to make more sense when you have that sorted out as to why you're writing the book yeah that's right and and it doesn't matter what genre you're writing i i have a non-fiction book idea that i've been wrestling with for a really long time and i know the reason i can't quite pin it to the page as I don't really know what I'm trying to say and why exactly I care. I have mm. a vague idea, but the the particular idea, you really have to wrestle it down. So I, I like that, um, that motivation from this author. And she, she also has a really smart strategy. This is the first in a series. And she so she's got a, a strategy for building out the series and combining these genres. And it's going to end, the romance will end at the the end of the the series. So, you know, she's really thought it through. She's got a great, a great strategy. It's going to be an epic fantasy quest. Who doesn't like an epic fantasy quest with the battle to save the universe? So, you know, so much good stuff going on here and so much good intention going on here. Um, can you tell there's a big butt coming? <laughs> yeah. Where's this big butt? You'd spear. We're back, we're up back to bodice rippers. <laughs> The, big butt. The, the butt is the second you start reading these pages, there, there are problems. And the, the first two problems that hit my eye, you, you may not think matter that much, but those two things are what I would call presentation. So the way she has laid the book out, there are no indentations on the paragraph. She's hmm, used it a line space between paragraphs and then each paragraph is a block. And this is a non-standard presentation style. A, a typical presentation style is a paragraph is indented and there's not that extra line space. And just that, just the way it hits your eye is, it's hard to read. So that was one thing. And similarly, in the in the first two pages, some very bad typos. And you know, the the thing with typos, we talk about, we've talked to the about them on the book lab before. There's always going to be mistakes in books. There just are. It's impossible to make it perfect. There's too many words to make it perfect. Yeah. But when you have a typo in the first few pages, and there's a sentence um, that actually has two typos so you know it's not just a mistake when there's two typos in one sentence you know that it's it it's sloppy and the um the words i'm referring to are there in some dialogue on page two there is um a character shimani and shimani shrugged and says that too and there's a, a capitalization error in that um in that line and a, a, um, a punctuation error as well, because 
a character can't shrug words. You say words. You can't shrug words. So there's, you know, it's two oh, mistakes. And- so you could say Shimani shrugged full stop. Yes. That, that too, she said. Or added, or, yeah. You know, so in my else. mind, there's two grammatical errors there. It should be a period. Okay. It should be a capital. And you know, you think, well, that's not a big deal. Give her a break. But uh, you know, life life is short for a reader. And yeah. and if it's hard for me to read the page, and there's typos on the page, I'm probably not going to go on. So you know, those little things make a really big difference. Um, so that's one thing. And and the thing that was. I think tough about this is, is Michelle actually writes good dialogue. It's snappy. It's, it's fun. It's conveying information. Um, you know, it has a nice rhythm and flow, but, but these mistakes, um, you know, are bad. Um, so, so that's the first thing. And then, but the really big thing that I really want to dig in and talk about here is because it's a problem for so many people and it's a problem for, beginning writers for very seasoned writers. It's a problem for everyone. And the, we're talking about info dumps and mm. the, the way to think about the reason it's a problem for everyone is I think it's a phase of writing. There's a phase of writing where you do sort of dump info in. And what, what a lot of writers do is they don't solve those problems. They, they do these info dumps and, and then they move on and, and those info dumps get baked into their work. Whereas the, the way to think about it is, okay, my draft has info dumps. It just does. Everybody's does. Now I'm going to look for them. I'm going to seek them out. I'm going to fix them. That's it's a, so it's a phase of writing or a phase of drafting that can be solved. And really writers really need to train themselves to see these and to, to fix them. So there's three different kinds of info dumps that are, can be found in these opening pages. So I want to go through each type and talk about where you can see it in, in this sample and how it can be fixed. Sure. So that's, we're going to dig in. That sounds great. So what do I mean by info dumps? It, it's um, a particular problem with any, any genre of writing that has to do with world building. So a world building is a world that is unlike our own. And really, when you think about it, almost every novel has world building. Because if I'm writing about 19, the 1980s, 80s and we're sitting here in 2021 the 1980s is kind of another world apart it's you know people wore different clothing they hadn't had a pandemic (laughs) you know there's there's a whole different world back then and and thinking about that world and building that world in this particular case there's a full-on other world with other beings other kinds of um uh sentient skills, there's a rules of the universe, there's all kinds of government hierarchies and power structures. You know, there's really a lot of world building in anything that is fantasy or sci-fi particularly. And so info dumps, the first kind of info dump that I want to talk about is description of the world. And, and that would be the author saying, let me tell you what this world looks like, or let me tell you how this world functions, or let me tell you what I'm seeing in this world, what the, that the setting is like, or how this particular part of the world works. So it's, it's, it's describing the, the world. And when I say that every writer tends to do this at a certain phase of writing, because you've built this world, you want to show it to people. You want you want them to be in it. You want them to see what you see. It's a very natural thing to want to do this. But I think when you also, you also feel they the reader needs to know, right? Yeah, you think they need to know how this world works. Otherwise, nothing will make sense. Which I th- that's right. You might go on to say this, but I think it's actually a mistake because I don't think you do need to know all that stuff to uh, follow the story. But anyway, go on. Well, you ask the perfect question because the perfect question is when does the reader need to know what you're going to tell them? Do they really need to know this piece of information at this moment? And and odds are really good that they don't. And so the way you solve this problem is in fact to think what what do they need to know when? And and 
holding a little curiosity as a reader, holding a little curiosity in your head is not a bad thing. What, you know, like what's going on here or what is this world? It seems something seems off or strange or, you know, that's good in a reader. Those are good questions. If, if we're going to get answers in good time, but um, what, what Michelle does here in the very beginning with a info dump about the setting is she, so I'm in a paragraph that, um, that is, uh, sorry, I just got to get the percentage. It's 12%. So it's Moto shook his head and looked out over Crystal Lake. This place often provided him peace and usually without interruption. The early morning light gleamed off the mist of the waterfall and brushed the surface of the glass smooth water. Much of Crystal Lake and Meadow were illusion-like, not exactly an illusion, but close to the untrained eye. A path led from each of the six original Kaholi villages to Crystal Lake. Not directly, the paths were portals from and to each of the villages. Moto turned his attention back to Shimani. Tell the queen I'm fine. So you can see that this info dump is just shoehorned in here. The, the writer wanted the reader to know what crystal, the importance of Crystal Lake and why it was here and what it looked like and, and how it connected to the way the villages operate. And there's this inf and as it feels like a fire hose to the, the reader. It, you know, you feel just just blown back by all this information. And you lose the thread of the story and the conversation. You lose why Moto, who's our main character, is even thinking about this. And 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 you're you're spending so much time trying to follow. Okay, wait. Here's the lake, and here's what it looks like. And oh, it's not an illusion, but is it? I'm not sure. And what are these paths? And you're off now on a whole other tangent, which is you don't want to lose the reader like that. And so the, this type of info dump, this setting information info dump, the way to solve this is you want to be in the character's head. And that's true no matter whether you're writing in first person or third person. When you're following a character, you're following them and what they think and what they know and what they see. And so in this particular situation, it's, it's really quite unlikely yeah. that Moto would look at this lake and think about yeah. how the paths were connected to each of the six villages. He knows that he's lived there his whole life. He's yeah. walked these paths. He understands that about the setting. So he is not thinking this through. This is, it really feels like author intrusion for the, cause they, the author wants the reader to know. So we need to get this information in a way that, that Moto knows that he, like, what does he actually think when he's looking at this lake and these paths? Does, you know, maybe he even says he looks out at these paths that he's been traveling his whole life or, or that he knows like the back of his hand or, you know, some, something like that, that then is going to lead him to make a conclusion in the moment about the setting. So okay. I know that's kind of a lot. <laughs> no, that's, that's brilliant. Uh, can I ask a question then? So there are two ways of tackling this, and you've given the answers to how to spot it, which is, would it be normal in the flow of things for this person to start waxing lyrical about these things? So two ways, to, that's to how to spot it. Two ways to deal with it. One is you, in, you introduce a device where they can say that, like for instance, they're showing a stranger around. Yep. Who says, what What the hell are these things? And he explains. So that's one way of doing it, which I do feel is a little bit clunky, but is a way of doing it. Another way, which I prefer, and I'm going to quote, not quote, but I'm going to refer to Ian M. Banks, a brilliant sci-fi author who does this, is that he doesn't explain this stuff, which is what I was getting at earlier. If you read his books, he explains it at the moment they go through a portal. One of them might make an off, off the heart cuff remark. So you suddenly realize this is not a normal path. But he trusts the reader because it's a very that's right. Because you're you're then with the characters in their world. You're suddenly get a glimpse of them talking to each other, and you're intrigued, which is what you alluded to at the beginning. So you that's don't right. you don't even need to have this clunky device of delivering the information. You can actually trust your reader. Right. There's no reason we actually have to know this about this lake and these paths at this moment. There's nothing in this moment that's making me, the reader, think. Well, wait. 
what are these paths or what is this like? We don't care right now. And, and so it is, it's in the wrong place. That's part of the problem. And what I was saying before is it's fine to have these info dumps. If you're writing a first draft, do it, dump the info in. Then when you go back, to to edit or revise you look at this chunk and you think wow that doesn't fit there that's not in his head there's no reason this has to be here does it have to be here if so how can i do a better job of it here if it doesn't have to be here where can i move it or to your point does it have to be here at all is this you know there's a difference between there's a vast difference between the author having to know the information and the reader having to know the information. Yeah. You, the author, must know this information and inside and out. And, and then how you drip it out to the reader is a different decision. And most people, when they get into info dump problems, they're conflating the two things. Well, I know this about the lake and these paths and this history, and I want my reader to know it, so I'm gonna dump it on them. And that, you know, it's a different, it's a different knowing you need to know it but the reader may not yeah you know I, I again i would refer anybody to read they're quite short as well the ian M. banks culture series book so player of games uh consider flea was a couple of the early ones and i can remember in one of them i think it's the player of games where a girl says to a, a boy a woman says to a man so sort of, you've always been a man and he, he sort of shrugged it off and, and they carried on. And that was his way of telling you in their particular universe, you can change gender and it's quite common. And it's a little bit unusual for somebody to choose one gender and stay that way their whole lives. One little bit of dialogue did that. That's brilliant. And in, a, in another less skillful set of hands, that's a page of explaining the history of that and, and whatever. And, uh, clunky. Yeah. but I, I, that's how he writes those books that's why i find it intriguing he doesn't explain stuff until he get until somebody gets into the portal you don't know it's there type thing it's yeah no it's great so there's another type of info dump there's three types that i've pulled out here that first type was was a description setting type the second type can be found at 19 percent and the paragraph when it became apparent the night terrors would not stop and this is an instance of of straight up it's it's the show don't tell thing it's straight yeah. up telling and the the author here so i'll read this short bit when it became apparent the night terrors would stop shimani and sari convinced moto to confide in the queen about his night terrors queen shakti called the council of shanis together at which point they grilled him until he lost his temper and stormed out for some reason, the queen restrained from administering dis disciplinary actions against him for the disrespect he displayed towards the council and herself. Instead, all gave him a wide berth and acted as if the incident didn't exist. So this should 100% be a scene, meaning we watch it unfold, we're in it, we see it happen, we see the characters engaged in this action rather than just being told about it. And or it shouldn't be here. One of the two. We either needs to be an active scene or or cut it. And and again, it's fine to have these in a rough draft. I I see this when I say seasoned writers do this. I see this in extremely accomplished New York Times bestselling writers. Their drafts will have things like that. And you know, as a, a book coach or an editor, all I have to do is flag it and say should be a scene. And they're like, oh right, get it good, I'll do that. You know, it's, it, it happens. So the idea is not to prevent it from happening. It's to, to see it. And, and so in this particular instance, unfortunately, I feel that this author has, has put a rough draft up for sale and it's, it's a good story. It's interesting. She's got a whole world. She's got these great characters and, and she could fix this. Just, this needs to be a scene and, and we need to be actively watching it unfold yeah and and you know what it's actually of the process which as you say is long and tortuous writing a book this is the bit i found the most enjoyable when my editor said we need to see this he said it a few times to me we yeah. need we need to see this and and i was like oh you know because it's been going yeah. a long time loved writing it out because you've created these characters and actually writing a scene where something happens in front of the reader 
is so much more interesting than than not doing that. And um, so I think it's quite an enjoyable part of the revision process is is turning that into a scene where the reader learns that. And and the thing, the reason that the the reason that writers do this is because you can already see it. You know you know what happened. You can imagine it because you made it up, and it's in your head, alive and real and whole. And so when you dump it in like this, to, you know it's easy to think, well, they're going to feel that they're going to feel it and see it the way that I do as the writer. But they don't. To us, it's just again, it's just dumped in here and and there's nothing engaging about it in this particular um instance i i read this part three times because i couldn't figure out if the the writer was actually telling me something that had happened before or was telling me something that was happening in story present and it was so uh strange strange to me that it was dumped in like this that i that i had to read it three times if you're if your readers are having to work that hard, you're done. You're yeah. toast. <laughs> uh, and we should add, I did exactly this in my draft. Yeah. I did this. and um, I Everybody could, does. I remember fixing one in particular of uh, a female character musing back to the old days of how things used to be different, all in her own head, sitting there. And I thought, well, this is quite clever because she's musing like people do sometimes. But the editor, again, either you or uh, somebody said, no, uh, this is just a dump. And, and I, what I, I wanted to keep it in, so I turned it into a little conversation between her and her husband when they're feeling a little bit too old at a party that's getting out of control and, and him reminding her that they used to, you know, set fire to the piano a few years ago in Singapore when they were there and her laughing. And that was a love. I thought it turned out, again, so I was saying I quite enjoyed doing that revision because that, that was a nice little bit of, the reader being there for the moment something happened in the past without it being well and also what you did there i'm smiling if people are listening they can't see me smiling i'm smiling because what you did there was you you told the reader so much about the relationship between those two people that that they had grown old together that they had you know lived that sort of wild time together that that they could laugh about it that that they were and that, okay and that with- becomes the purpose of that and the incidental bit is is learning that they set fire to the piano in the old days and had a wild time in far off places um it's beautiful and just one point i want to make if if the read i mean the writer is thinking i don't want to write out this scene it's just like a dumb little boring scene where people are talking about leaving a party if if that is in fact true then it shouldn't be there at all and and if you can make meaning of it if we can see your characters using it making sense of the world through it then no a walk in the park or across the street or to get the mail can be can be deeply meaningful so there it's either got to have meaning or or don't have it in there yeah and make it short like that ian m banks example it can be one aside in a bit yes. of dialogue that informs the reader. Oh yeah, they, you know. Okay, so that's almost almost flashback, isn't it? Sort of, um, he thought about what used to happen type thing. And a, a flashbacks are always a bit, you should be very tr- careful about flashbacks, I think. Yes, and when I said that I couldn't tell if this this bit at, at 19% was, was a flashback or was story present, I couldn't tell. And the thing to remember about about flashbacks is they're triggered by something that's happening in story present. So whatever is unfolding in the narrative in real time is going to trigger the character to think about that thing in the past. So in your case, the party triggered them to remember that other party and and a bit in their relationship back in the day. Um, And and the, the training, the best training for this for any writer this this will kind of mess with your head. But if you pay attention to your own life and your own self, and if you watch yourself when something happens, anything could be anything that flashes through your mind that takes you back in time or um, you, what you find is that every single thing in our day, it's it's kind of horrifying has just this massive backstory attached to it this library of memory this this whole kind you know series of almost like dominoes that fall when you have a thought you can't not 
do it. A human can't, you can't get out of this. And, and the way to, to think about it as a writer is which thing is, is my is going to trigger my character to have those thoughts that we're going to see that backstory. Because if you tried to capture every single thing that went through someone's head in, there's actually a, a novelist, Nicholson Baker, he wrote a book called The Mezzanine. And the entire, it's a novella, I believe. The entire story takes place on a seven, I think it's a, seven minutes sounds too long, seven seconds, a very short uh, escalator ride. The entire right. thing is just an escalator ride. And it's all the things going, you know, triggered in that moment going through this character's head it's quite horrifying really and so when i say the exercises to pay attention in your own life i want to tell you a story and i and i i wanted to come up with a story about how this works to to tell our listeners and i thought okay i'm talking to james i got to come up with with an idea and and then one came to me and you'll love this because it's about a bicycle okay. i did this for you i love my bike so <laughs> So um, what I what I did was I tried to think in my own self, when did this happen recently in my own life where something happened in in my in the flow of my life that triggered a whole series of series of past events. And what happened was I bought a new bicycle and the the reason that I bought this bicycle um, my husband is a cyclist too, and he wanted to go into the bike store because now you can do that. Hmm. And um, he had ordered a pair of gloves. So he said, I want to go in and pick up these gloves. And so I came into the bicycle store with him and I saw a bike on the floor and um, I immediately in my head said, I want that bike. It was, it was instant. I want that bike. So that's the trigger. If I'm writing a story we're we're going along, that's the trigger. I, I saw that bike. I want that bike. So the, the, question at hand is what led me to that snap decision? What, what was behind that snap decision? Why does that bike matter? And if you're writing a story, this is what you've got to unpack. And this is what, this is what showing not telling means. So in my case, and everybody can do this, just think about something that happens in your life that triggers some other thing. So what happened was I loved the color of this bike. It was this beautiful teal. Well, you'll you'll love this, James. So it's a e-bike. I bought an e-bike, oh. and it's a and it's a Trek. So oh, there you go. I wish I could turn a, my camera around to see my Trek, which hangs on the wall in my office. That's how it's a, it is. Absolutely gorgeous, beautiful machine, and it was this beautiful blue teal color. And everything about this bike just said that is your bike. So. It, the blue reminded me of a bike I had as a kid. And I used to ride my bike all the time as a kid. I was, I was a tennis player and I would ride to the tennis club and I ride to school and I had this blue, it was a Schwinn. It was the clunky old, you know, 10 speed Schwinn. So I'd see this beautiful blue Trek, Trek bike and I want it. And, and in fact, I bought it. I bought the bike like in five minutes. I bought the bike. I just said, I want the bike. I'm buying the bike. It was quite an expensive bike. So this moment triggered the thing. But here's the reason why that would matter in a story and why we would make meaning of it. If I was just telling you that you'd be like, you're probably sitting there right now thinking, what is the point? <laughs> you saw a blue bike. You reminded you of a bike you had as a kid. You bought the bike. Why are you telling me this? Why do I care? And the, the meaning that would be made from it is if I were to tell you, my mother just died and I bought this bike about two weeks after my mother died. And so this bike that reminded me of my childhood bike represented to me freedom. You know, everybody knows what it's like to be on a bike and to feel free, to have the wind in your hair and on your face and you know you're out there in the world there was like a sense of freedom there was a sense of of fun like i don't i didn't own a bike when i bought this trek bike i haven't owned a bike in probably 30 years and so my seeing this bike and saying i want that bike was weird <laughs> and it but the meaning that it had for me is i've been mired in 
when somebody dies, there's so much that has to be done and so much that has to be taken care of. And when it's a parent, it's now I'm the one in charge. I'm the matriarch. I'm, you know, have all the responsibility. And so the idea of fun was an antidote to this crushing sense of loss and also stuff I had to do this adulting I had to do as the kids say right so it was it was um represented freedom it re represented fun it was in a strange way a connection back to my mother back to when I was a child riding my bike and I would come home to her and she'd be making spaghetti or you know whatever and and there was also wrapped up in that a sense of power I could buy this bike. I could see this expensive bike. And in a flash, I could decide that I wanted to buy this bike. And because I, I'm an adult and I'm in charge of my own self and I'm, I'm alive and I'm living my life. So you can see how so much meaning was wrapped up in, in that story of my seeing the bike, buying the bike, bringing the bike home within with just, just like that. And if I were telling the story and I was just dumping this information onto you about mm. is the bike was blue, it was Trek. This is how much it cost. It had, you know, uh, black handlebars. There was a little bell on it. Like, uh, you know, it was in the middle of the shop. Uh, the guy couldn't believe when I said, I'm taking it home. He said, well, don't you want to ride it? <laughs> like, like if I told you all that, you, you'd still be saying, well, so what? But if I tell you what it triggered in me that mattered, mm. Now, or, now, or even I'm, better, if the reader knows from the story exactly. that you had a blue bike that meant a lot to you, and this was two weeks after you lost your mother, and, and right. the reader knows why you're, and the your husband might be saying, "What the hell are you talking about? Why do you suddenly want this bike?" But the reader knows right. that's a lovely. I mean, that would be the perfect way right. of doing it, and no info right. that needed there. Right. So if I'm if I'm writing a draft and I've got this dump in there of information. My job is to tease it out, figure out why does it matter? Why is it there? And then like you said, okay, either got to seed this in earlier. I've got to pull this thread all the way through the story. Or in the moment, I have to make sure why that the reader's going to understand why this matters. Why am I telling, why am I telling about the, the bike that I bought that day, you know, as opposed to other things I did that day, or, you know, you know, you have to, there has to be a reason why. So it's the, the trigger you're looking for. And my long story about the bike is that I want people to pay attention in their own lives because you will have a thing that happens to you today, I promise, that has that those layers that that ripple back and, and that have all this meaning attached to them. And we're going through our days processing those layers all the time and they're present and they're there and that's what we want our characters to do because that's what it means to be 3d and alive yeah. and and uh, this guy moto in our story had all these things go down and happen that you know he the queen didn't call him out and he did counsel and he didn't do the thing and you know there's something that's that all tied to that that could be triggered to tell us that information in the scene rather than just having it dumped in. And if all this sounds hard, it, it is quite hard and it doesn't come, it certainly with me does not come in one draft. It, it comes from rewriting and going through it again and, um, but worth it to get there, to make it, I don't want to use the word clever. That's almost like an insult something these days, but um, skillful, natural, yeah. I mean, another reason why that muse thing, you know, in my, my case, she let back a thought about the old days and you then sort of describe some of that. And, and this paragraph here is that a bit like would that person describe all the scenery in front of them we had earlier in the same way in a flashback, you get a smell that reminds you of your own school and you see things, but you don't describe them to yourself. Right. Because you know what they look like and you're it's just so again, that feels false, doesn't it? That, right. That you're the beds in the dormitory were laid out like this and and the, the headmaster was bearing over me you can use one little clip you suddenly felt like you're in the shadow of the headmaster again right but you that description it takes you out of the moment again doesn't it 
Right. We want to stay in in the head of the character as they're making sense of things. And that's what. So I just finished reading an, a novel. Um, have you read Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell? No, I know the book, but I have not read it. Oh, my gosh. I just this book just is spectacular. I mean, Maggie O'Farrell is just a incredible writer. She's an Irish woman and um hamnet is is a story of the writing well it's not really true it's not the writing it's the years before shakespeare writes hamlet so hamnet is the is the same as hamlet and um this book was one of those novels we've all read them where i could barely breathe when i was reading it and i somebody would say something to me my husband would say you know whatever you know do you want to start making dinner and and i would be like <gasps> there's another person in the room, you know, I'm not in 1500 England. Like you're so immersed in the story. Nothing pulls you out. That's what's so masterful. There's nothing that makes you think actually you're sitting in Santa Barbara, California, Jenny, and it's five o'clock at night or whatever, nothing. You're just in it, in it, in it, in it. And, and to, to read any book like that, and be so immersed in it. I mean, that's what we're all going for. And the problem with the info dumps in this example are we just keep getting pulled out. Oh, there's the author. There's the mechanism, the gears, if you will, the, the, you know, we can see it um, being made and we don't want that. We want, we want to be like I was when, when I was reading Hamnet, just in it, just in it, like what's gonna happen to the herbs that she's just dried and are they gonna blow away in the wind? You know, whatever the thing is, uh, you just, you want your reader to be so bought in that they're they're there with you. Brilliant. Well, I've just ordered um, it. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's unbelievable. And, you know, it's a really great example. The reason I bring up Hamnet is it's a really great example of there are many scenes in this book where very little happens. When I talked about the herbs drying, there's a woman who's, who, uh, it's, it's Shakespeare's wife, Anne Hathaway, who's um, very involved with plants. She, some people sort of think she's a witch. There's a little bit of a sense of mystery around her. And she's very knowledgeable about plants. So she's always going out and picking the rose hips or, you know, drying the seeds or doing this and that with, with plants. So there's a lot of scenes where you would say nothing happens. She goes out and she picks the rose hips <laughs> or she goes out and she does. And, and if I told you that that's what the story about is about, you would say that sounds like the most deadly boring thing I've ever read in my entire life. But while she's picking the rose hips, she is making so much meaning of her environment and her family, and she's trying to keep people alive. It turns out, who knew? There was a plague, the Black Plague mm. at the time of, of um, this story, which is why Maggie O'Farrell just wrote, wrote the book. And so it's, um, it's gripping because it's a, a plague story as well. And this woman is literally trying to save her family. And when she's going out to, to do these herbs, no, you know, no so oh, sorry. Um, I want to bring up one more type of info dump that um, our author Michelle um, does, which is at 22%. This is this is another type of info dump. It's the giant, long, historical, generational info dump about all our people and the way we have been these many years. And um, that you know, as a youth, he questioned the elders in his village. It's and like this is the pulling the camera way back and and yeah. this talking is a this about is a tell, isn't it? This is telling, not showing. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, this is a long, long passage, which I will not read, of historical info dump. And, and it, it actually is exactly the same as the first thing we saw, which was the backstory description info dump. This is just now sort of genealogical and generational and our people. And, um, you know, so we saw in the moment setting description info dump we saw 
uh, what happened to a character info dump. That was the middle one. And now we're seeing history info dump. And they're, they're all a little bit different and, and need to be handled a little bit differently, but they stem from the same problem, which, which as you said, James, is it's just you need one more draft to fix them. That's, that's what you need is like, do it, put them down, dump it in there, and then have, have a draft where you're fixing those things. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they may ripple out all the way through the novel and that's okay, but um, don't leave them because they, they kick the reader out of the story. That's what happens. And this is book one. So yeah. it's really important for people to come hooked and enjoy it and move on to book two. Commercially important to sell the book. So and there's so the much and that could could be done well here. It's a really she's got like I said a really great strategy, really great story, really great motivation. It it sounds like she, her character she's got it's um people fall in love across worlds. They are they're not supposed to cross worlds yeah. and they and they do. It's it's fabulous and it's all the tropes and she's a, a writer who loves all the tropes as many as many readers do we want to see these these different tropes in the epic quest and the lovers across worlds you know so much goodness here but the info dumps are killing it and there but for the grace of god go all of us writers because this is a very common one um showing don't telling is 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 almost covers everything we ever talk about one way and another but this is one example of it is it taking people out of the moment and it took me a long time to get it you know a long time of being told by you and, and andrew and others <laughs> and rewriting and finally it was like a by jove he gets it moment and uh there's still some of it in there, I'm sure, but but stripping it out completely. So there's nothing in there that's not there happening in front of people and moving things along and character development. Um, yeah, yeah, and there's one thing that I will will say about that, which which may sound self-serving, but but it's also just really true. I actually think it's quite impossible to see these in our own work. I think yeah. you need an editor, a book coach, somebody, a really good critique partner, somebody else who's not you to help you spot them. It's really hard. I, I mean, I've had people send me, writers send me manuscripts where they would have sworn up and down that there were no info dumps. And, you know, I, I get it. And it's not that I'm so great. It's just that I'm not the writer. And I, you know, I go through and it's just like here, 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 here. And, and they're just, you know, it's like, what? How could I not see that? It's, it's very hard to see our own our own info dumps <laughs> yeah yeah well it's a it's a service you need to pay for i think editing yeah we've always said i think that. it's true you can skimp on some things you can do stuff yourself but not that um we've always said that so i think that's true and i do have a, a handout that oh, we can share brilliant. with your download on how to stop info dumps um, before they start. And it's just a way to help you begin to recognize them and um, try to, to be aware of them and um, to try to fix them. So we'll share that. Okay, okay. Well, that'll be selfpublishingformula.com forward slash book lab nine will be where that is. If you go there, uh, pop your email address and we'll deliver it to you directly. Uh, now, uh, have you been on the bike? Tell us about the bike. <laughs> been out, where is it? Did you not love that I picked a bike story for you? A Trek and bike it, story. You know, do you know I have a Trek? A Trek bike story. Um, the bike, James, is the most amazing thing. Uh, to not have a bike for, for so long and to get on the bike. And first of all, that cliche that you never forget how to ride a bike. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, like just that was amazing. What like, bike I, is it? What, never, what model of Trek is it? You don't know. I don't know. It's it's the it's an e-bike with the oh the internal... e-bike yes yeah. And what does your husband think about you having a motor in your bike? Is he? Oh, he has total disdain. Yes, cor correct. Well, you yes, need, you need correct. To be, you need to be pedaling. Uh, yes. No, Mark Dawson has one of those. He loves it. He has a motor. I pedal. An e -bike. It's a, a pedal assist. Yes. So you have. To I know pedal. it's not a motorbike. But yes, my husband has total disdain. He has the real track yes. version of the fake <laughs> bike that I bought. And uh, yeah, he thinks it's cute, air quotes, very yes. cute. 
but you're, you have but that you're, little... it's cute, but you're a fraud. Is that what you say yeah, with those airplanes? Complete quotes? fraud. Yes. Yeah. And um, I absolutely adore it. And I and I and I write it. And um, oh, even worse, I got a big basket on the back so I can go to the grocery store and put Toto um, in there. <laughs> But it's fabulous and I love it. And um, and I bought it in in the second, which is a thing I never have done before. Yeah. But it, yeah, it carries great meaning for me and great joy. So it's Lovely. a thing we all need. Well, we need a picture of you on the bike. Get your husband take one. Get it get it to yes. me quickly in time for it to go over this interview. Uh, that's yes. been, it's been mammoth. It's been epic tonight. Thank you so much indeed. My dog's very hungry in there because I was supposed to feed him and her. Go an feed hour them. Ago. But uh, it's been worth every second, as always. Thank you so much indeed, Jenny. Brilliant to talk to you. And uh, we'll see you next time. I know you and I are going to do some live stuff in the autumn. We'll talk about that soon as well. All right. Bye. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. So there you go. Stuart, not particularly impressed with the cover. Thought it looked like it was homemade. Uh, Blurb, pretty good. Brian, I think, really did a fantastic job in that blurb. Um, and we'll hear what Michelle thinks in a moment. And for the reading, good story, good characters, but too much info dumping, too much info dumping. And a really good interview, I thought, with Jenny, explaining what that actually means. It can be just a sentence that doesn't need to be there, that takes the reader out of that moment. I thought that was a really good interview for us uh, as writers. But let us see how she took it. This is Michelle's reaction to those experts. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Michelle Hanley, I first of all, thank you so much for your courage and bravery of stepping inside the book lab. Nobody comes out of the book lab without scars, but you knew that when yes. you went in there, right? That's why you, that's why you went in there. Um, okay, you've had a chance, I think, to, to watch the feedback. And uh, where should we start? Should we start, uh, let's start with the blurb, shall we? Okay, we can do that. What did you take from Brian's feedback? Uh, I took, well, I felt really good about Brian's feedback when he, you know, at least said I had the parts there so that my classes I took didn't go to waste. <laughs> at least we got something out of that. But um, after reading Brian's blurbs and how he had done it, it was just amazing. You know, I felt like, okay, my book may not be up to par for the blurb. <laughs> Are they going <laughs> to like the book if they read the blurb? But I went ahead and purchased the blurbs for book two and three. So I oh. thought it was fantastic. There you go. You were, but, so, you were definitely sold on that. No, I thought they were great definitely. blurbs. I didn't, and I think I said this in the chat with Brian, I, they weren't, you hadn't done a bad job at all. And I find it, I found mm -hmm. it incredibly difficult doing a blurb and, um, uh, yeah. but, but when it's at arm's length, that's maybe the best way of doing it. I was thinking about a, a way maybe next time with my next book, finding a blurb buddy, I could write their blurb <laughs> and they could write my blurb. Because I think I'd find it easier writing somebody else's than mine. And I think that's the problem yeah. when we're so close to this story we're so proud of. We don't oh, really yeah. know where to start and just selling it in a few sentences. Definitely. And then for me, I'm not just with the story, but the whole trilogy and then the project itself is humongous. I mean, we've got seven trilogies coming and a seven book series coming. So I, I've got all of this information in my head and to pare it down just to that couple, just to that story was incredibly hard. My partner helped me with it, but you know, we're trying to get something that people want to read. And Brian, he just, he's amazing with words. Although, uh, I think he gave you a hard time for not using him, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, I should have used him. But uh, <laughs> I, I like to do everything myself at least once. And then I realized <laughs> I, realize I need to use I can understand that. Uh, now, yeah. let's move on then to the cover. Um, now, Stuart okay. was, you know, he was not overwhelmed with the quality of the cover. He felt mm -hmm. it looked like it wasn't a professional cover. Um, actually, mm -hmm. I think it probably was done by somebody else. It wasn't done by you, was it? Well, it wasn't done by me, but it was done by my partner and okay. we worked together to collaborate. We took Stuart's classes to try to come up with something. Um, so yeah, it, it was homemade. Um, part of the difficulties with the covers was because I am crossing genres, I'm not fitting into any one genre. I am trying to blend three genres and, and I'm aware of the uphill battle. You know, this is, <laughs> this is not something I thought would become a unicorn in any sense of the word, but it definitely is something that I think can, can work. It, you know, it's possible. It's just that it has to be done in the right way. And 
So doing the covers was kind of difficult in trying to incorporate a feel for those three genres without putting readers off. And then the other part was the expense, you know, yeah. we starting out, we just, we didn't have the money to start an author business, but we had the desire and the story. So we went ahead and, and started it. But our other thing and concern was we didn't want to sink a lot of money into a story. We had no idea what the reception would be. And if this was really something that we could make take off. So we wanted to take some time and, and just see our readers going to gravitate to it, uh, what, despite the imperfections. <laughs> the, yeah, and but, every story has imperfections, well, every cover, et cetera. Yeah. Um, where are you with your feeling on, on the viability of the stories now? Because you're quite a bit of a way down the line now. You must have had some feedback from authors and uh, readers and so on. Oh, definitely. I think there definitely is viability. I've had some, I haven't really gone after reviews. So the reviews that we have have been organic. I just asked for reviews in the back of the book in our newsletter. Um, our newsletter, we're, we're what, over a thousand. I think we're approaching almost 1100 subscribers right now. And we've gotten some five-star interesting reviews that talk about the blending of the fantasy and the sci-fi. And they seem to be receptive to what I'm doing and enjoying the story and the characters. Um, the, one of the first feedbacks, it was really funny because my first book has some heat in it. My second book has absolutely none. So when I write sexual scenes, it's, it's based on the couple. And if it's important to them, if it propels the story forward, it's not written just to write some, some steam into there. So one of the very first five-star reviews I received on the first book was she enjoyed the story, enjoyed the character, is going to continue to read, but she could do without the sex parts. <laughs> so it was like, okay, yeah, that can I be understand. A bit, a bit of a divide if they're not expected, can't they? Um, right. Okay, so so what are you going to do about covers? Because you're still faced with that quandary of, of costs, aren't you? And then they're not cheap, particularly if you've got one book, that's one thing. If you've got a series of books, you are looking at a, an investment. We are. And, and the funny thing is, just before we heard from the book lab, my partner and I were talking about investing in covers. We knew that what we had wasn't going to fly for long. We just, we put together what we could. And we were already looking for an illustrator. So we have a little bit more money now than we did. Um, we haven't, we're not breaking even, but we have had some success that we're able to reinvest into the company and into the business. So we, we actually have hired an illustrator for all three covers. Okay. And fortunately, hopefully he'll work with us on getting the cross genre message across while fitting into close enough. Uh, Stuart, and, and I felt so bad for Stuart. <laughs> he seemed to feel really bad about the coverings, like, I can't say anything nice about this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, he was very <laughs> impressed with the way they put the extra finger on the hand. Yeah, I didn't do that. <laughs> that came from Photostock. Well, nonetheless, someone did but, it. Um, okay, I mean, we should say, and I think I said this with Stuart, that there's nothing mm -hmm. wrong with homemade covers. In fact, mm -hmm. Stuart's group has some, some of the students are absolute geniuses at it, aren't they? I see some <laughs> of the stuff they plump, put a post in there. It's not for me. So the problem right. is not doing them yourself. The problem is them looking like, They've come from a home or, or DIY, exactly. but it is, it's tough not to crack because it's an expensive part of it. And editing is so mm -hmm. crucial and so important. We'll move on to that in a minute. Um, that's okay. probably where your, your money's better spent, isn't it? In that first instance than them. Um, but anyway, so there's going to be a new cover. So you'll have to let us know when they're up and live. There is. Uh, he won't be available until December. And we've actually hired him to do all three covers because we are doing a huge project. We want to keep the author brand consistent. So probably January, the new covers will be uploaded. Okay. We look forward but to that. But the blurbs will go up shortly after this episode airs just to give the listeners an opportunity to see what's out there, what it looks like now, especially authors who might be thinking about going through the book lab as victims, you know, so yeah. that they have an idea what starting point is. And then we'll put the blurbs up probably a couple of days after this airs. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's lovely to uh, to have that blurb there and see what difference that makes. Mm -hmm, um, definitely. Okay, so editing. Uh, Jenny's thing was mm -hmm. info dumping. And, you know, I've had this, mm -hmm. I, I've been through, I think I said in the interview, exactly the same as you. It was the one thing all the way through my development editor who read the board. This, he did an assessment as all the way through. He said, this is, this is telling, not showing. And, you know, and I had to rewrite lots of it. So did that resonate with you, some of the feedback you got from Jenny about info dumps? Oh, definitely. I had no idea about those three info dubs that she had. I, I, when looking and reading about the craft, you always hear about don't do a grocery list. 
type of information dump that way. But the info dumps that she was talking about, I just I didn't think about. And I think when an author creates a character, you think, well, they're going to do what I tell them to do anyway. So we don't really think about sometimes how realistic the person needs to be. And like she said, would Moto honestly be thinking all of that, looking at over the like, well, okay, no, (laughs) not really. And, you know, so I think it's definitely something to go through and to try to at least identify. Now, when we did start this out, finding an editor that we wanted to work with, finding a quality editor, because I'm I'm not going to sink money into an editor just to have an editor. So we weren't able to do that. We chose to go with Autocrit and try to run it through some programs to try to find the errors. We did find that I was a passive writer, so we were able to correct some of that. Um, but the the uh, dumps, like she talked about, I didn't even know what report and Autocrit that I could even look at to find those. But that definitely resonated. It helped me understand a little bit better, especially when you think about looking from the character's perspective and what would this character actually be thinking? And then your comment about trusting the reader, you know, that really resonated too, because I think that trusting the reader is very hard because there is so much information you want them to know and you don't want them to be confused later on. But at the same time, this is a journey for them and and they might have different perceptions and that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, that is a hard one to to get hold of. And I think that only comes from experience from writing, but it's something mm-hmm. those very good writers do do. And Stephen King talks right. about that. He talks about trusting the, the reader all the time. Um, and I, th- I think the bit that made the most sense to me when Jenny talks about this is, is that the info dump, even if it's a small thing, even if it's half a sentence or a sentence, mm-hmm. it just takes the reader out of that moment. Instead mm-hmm. of them being there with you as things are happening, it takes them out of it and it's almost pauses and that I think in the end will stop the reader enjoying moving forward with the stories so that's a really good reason not to go off and tell things but to but to exactly. have them developing in front of the reader so well you right. and I you and I both benefit from these conversations um uh, particularly <laughs> that one from from Jenny and I'm um you know I'm in book two now trying hopefully to put into practice all this stuff that that you know at, same with you we've learned through our writing process mm-hmm yeah, Jenny's great. I would love to be able to afford her. But even at this stage, I think I've got to sell a few more books. <laughs> I can't afford Jenny, just so you know that. Yeah. Oh, boy. I used. Uh, I love her advice. I, you know, I've got joined her newsletter and try yeah. to absorb everything I can. But at the same time, you know, like she talked about, authors are just so close to the story. It's hard to pinpoint some of those things that you just don't think about. Yeah. Maybe a author buddy, you know, writing buddy to read each other's books mm-hmm. and stuff is a good thing. I'm sure you find yeah. somebody in our community. Although you would at some point have to choose which genre author. Because, yeah, that is, that Choosing is, which genre? Yeah. <laughs> I just, I need an author in each of the three genres so that they, yeah. can, they can give me feedback from all three. <laughs> There's that, that's, um, I mean, these, these genres. So you've got a bit of mm-hmm. romance, fantasy, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. what's the other one? Sci-fi. Sci-fi, yeah. Right. I mean, they are, they can be very different. One sci-fi book can look nothing like a romance book, but there are, of course, right. there are lots of crossovers in there as well. Yeah. Um, was this a conscious decision at the beginning? Is it simply something you wanted to do and try, or is it something you've ended up with because that's where the story is? No, it was a conscious decision. I mean, Jenny was absolutely right when she said that I've strategized. And the funny thing is, is that I first wrote my very first copy of this book in 2000. And I have been working on this one story and one book for 20 years. So don't feel bad about your 10. No, (laughs) But it took me a long time to get the story out that I saw inside of me. And then when my youngest daughter went to college, I came home to an empty house. I wasn't in any relationship. And I wanted to do this story in a way that it could be so much more than what it was. There's there's more to why I was writing the story. Uh, to me, I've... I've always had a problem with the difficulties that we have among the separate races. And so what got me started in thinking about the story is what if we were actually separate species and where would the species come from? So then I decided to place the story at the center of the universe where everything started. And it took me up until 2016. I started from scratch. I put away all of the copies. I have no idea how many manuscripts I have of this story. And in, in life I had, 
gotten, while my kids were in high school, I had obtained a bachelor and master's degree in psychology. So I tried to take what I had learned writing term papers and putting that into the research for the story. So about a year later, I have a 166 page encyclopedia of research and who these people are and what the worlds are and what their sciences are. And I divided out the magic that flows throughout the whole universe into a fantasy magic that can't be explained by science and then what I call a machine magic that is science and the ideas people get. Using Tesla as kind of an example of he was so far out of his time in the way he thought and the way he saw things that nobody could understand around him. So I wanted to meld all of that together, but then I also am obsessed with romance and with relationships and what makes them work, and what makes them not work. And so I brought that into creating seven key couples, which is where the seven trilogies come from. And I wanted to explore the relationship on top of the background that is the sci-fi and fantasy undertone story that will carry out through all of it and it it takes some planning and it takes some doing mm -hmm. to write this wow. when i finally got around to writing the book it took me two years for the first one a year for the second one and now it's going to be six months for the third one wow that's uh, so. motivating for me to hear um <laughs> that sounds great michelle and uh i'm excited about where this is going to go and particularly mm -hmm. with, with its repackaged as well with the um the cover and blurb and stuff and so it looks like 2022 could be the year where you find out if this yes. is if this this project of yours is going to work but uh, I've, I've got a feeling I mean there's got to be there's got to be market for there's so many readers out there it's really a case of them perhaps mm -hmm. investing in the paid ad side of things to try and find them <laughs> find oh yeah out. definitely yeah. the paid ads I'm going through I started with a class that Nicholas Eric offers about launching and trying to figure out a better launch strategy and how to get my book into more readers because basically the blurb the cover and the editing can be perfect but if you can't get it out into the readers, you can't find a way to let people know, then you're, you're just not going to get the readers. So that's yeah. my next task to work on for 2022. There's always something. Mm -hmm. Are you um, still working? In the moment I or? am, unfortunately. I do uh, coding. I code oh, okay. analytical reports. So okay. I have decided to go ahead and quit my job in December. So December 3rd will be my last day. Wow. Uh, financially, it's very scary because we are not prepared for this. But it's come to where I have to focus on this story full time. I have to believe enough in what we have to put my time and energy into it in order to help it grow with a project like this. If it takes too long to get the books to the readers, I'm going to lose the readers. And I know that. So I have to be able to produce the books faster. The stories are inside of me. So it's not about not having the stories developed already. It's just having the time to get them out. Yeah. Yeah. I so. hear that. Okay. Right. Well, Michelle, thank you again so much for stepping to lab. You've responded so positively to all the feedback, which is really heartening. And um, I th mm -hmm. it sounds to me like you've uh, you've had a good 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 experience in the lab. You, you know, I have, but I went into it knowing I was going to be victimized. <laughs> if you want to say that or criticize, but victimized you know, is a hard think... word. <laughs> victimized is, yeah. yeah. I, I'm sorry, I'll take that back, yeah. but. <laughs> I, when you said something about the victim when you made the announcement that just stuck with yes. me i said okay yes i'm a victim yeah. <laughs> i thought i was a winner but <laughs> we have to prepare people for the laboratory you you do and and i think that the one thing that new authors who want to go through this process have to understand is that you guys are not saying these things to be mean or to tear us down or ruin our career you're trying to help us and there's things that even though we take the classes, we might not perceive or understand because we don't have the experience to perceive it or understand it. So I think that an author has to believe in themselves enough that they can take constructive criticism. I think that you also have to look at who the criticism's coming from. And all three, Jenny Stewart and Brian, they're top in their field. They have been successful in what they do. And they they have valuable advice to share so if we can listen open-mindedly and take what they say then yeah we have the potential to improve our careers and if we can go in it with that kind of attitude i think that it's a lot better i i know unfortunately it, it takes a certain kind of thick skin that not everybody has but that's this business isn't it yeah it is um but it sounds like you've got exactly the right attitude and an attitude i think that will serve you very well michelle in the future so 
thank you again for stepping thank into you. the lab. It's been a great pleasure talking to you and good luck with the, uh, well, with thank the future. You. And, and thank you so much for picking me. I, that, that was such a thrill. I, I can't believe you guys did. That was great. Okay. Our pleasure. <laughs> thank you. This is the Self Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. Mark, I thought Michelle took it very well indeed. Um, really well, actually. Uh, and that, that, for me, says straight away, this is somebody who's going to succeed. Because taking on critique, uh, criticism, which not everybody does, if you've spent any time in an internet forum, you'll know, not everybody does. Uh, but she did extremely well. And uh, I think she accepted that the cover, uh, I think it was done by her partner, that uh, it, you know, if you can produce a cover that looks like a professional one you commission from a, a company or a pro, then fine, but most of us can't. And so um, that's, uh, you know, that's got to be something I think you've got to be aware of. And I think she knew they couldn't afford everything. And she said it was financial, but they will be investing. They think they're commissioned already, she said in the interview. The blurb, pretty good. She was delighted with Brian's and has immediately commissioned Brian to write the blurb for the other two books. And I thought they did. I thought, uh, what, is it best page forward? I can't remember what his service is called. Brian's service, but we should give it a plug because um, they, they did a super job with that. And finally, Jenny picked up on info dumps, Mark. And this is, there was quite a lot of info dumping. And I think the point I really took away from that discussion with Jenny is that info dumping, the main crime it commits is that it takes the, it's jarring for the reader. It takes them out of that moment of things happening, of being in someone's head, of moving forward. It's kind of sitting there and it's clunky way of, of, of putting in exposition. And the line I think I used in the interview, which Michelle picked up on that she said resonated with her is trust your reader. Trust, you don't have to spell everything out. You think you do. And as an amateur, as a newbie writer, I was absolutely guilty of that and probably still am. And learning to trust your reader, I think, is is such a key part of becoming a confident and good writer. Yeah, it comes with experience. It's not something that you, you immediately uh, get to grips with, but you you, you can uh, just kind of hint at things and tip them in certain directions where they can kind of draw, uh, connect the dots themselves and, and reach their own conclusion. You don't need to uh, have pages of exposition uh, explaining something that you think is important. It's much better just to do it naturally. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's a skill, but it comes with practice. You know, the, the more you write, the better you'll get at it. Yeah. And sometimes they don't need to know the stuff that we think they need to know. No, no that's uh, right. No. And that is more difficult, I think, in fantasy and science fiction. You know, people want to describe the world and universe build, but you can do some of that universe building just for your own sake, for knowing how you're going to characters are going to react. You don't necessarily have to spell it all out, I think. Listen to me like I'm an expert. Uh, but Jenny is an expert and she's very good at it. Good. Okay, look, it's been a long episode, but a really good one. I want to say a huge thank you to our experts, uh, Stuart, Jenny, and Brian, and a major thank you to Michelle, who did a brilliant job putting herself forward and then reacting so positively to that. Well done, Michelle. Good luck. We'll keep an eye on your page uh, in the future on Amazon to see what happens with it. I think her covers, I think she said from the interview, won't be uh, until the new year, but uh, we will look forward to those. Um, and uh, if you want to properly follow along, like I say, you can look at uh, how it was before if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash book lab nine. Next week, Mark, we're talking about dialogue. Excellent. One of my favorites. We're going to dialogue about dialogue. But until then, all that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.